the 26th. Also, I too want to keep remembering the Hay family in, uh, in my prayers and in yours. Uh, Jimmy's mother passed away last week. We continue to lift that family up. Thank you for doing that. And finally, I want to thank um, the Wolf Pack. Again, another thing they do for us is they put our sermons online. And Tom and Noah make sure that um, every Sunday the, my sermons show up on YouTube. So if you want to encourage somebody to follow this series as we come towards the end of Genesis and start Exodus, um, just go to YouTube, look up Lighthouse Presbyterian Church Paola, and there's a tab for all the sermons. Not only are they available in audio, but they're in video too. So you can watch my bald spot as I pace around the, the platform, just like here. Um, but we're finding that people want to catch up or be encouraged, and, and I just, I of course, want those, uh, want those sermons to be used. Let's pray. Father, not only do we want sermons to be used, we want to be useful. You're at work. We want to see it and join it. Holy Spirit, show us. Holy Spirit, be our teacher. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. What was meant for evil, our theme on this part, the second half of Genesis, we're following that amazing technicolor journey of Joseph's as a remnant is preserved. Joseph is the focus today in what he does. And, and I want you to, to just think, how does this remind me of Jesus? In Genesis 50 is the punchline. We'll come to this next week, but we've started with it. You intended to harm me, Joseph says to his brothers, you meant me evil. You, you guys put me in a pit. You wanted to kill me. You were jealous of me. You wanted to kill me, but understand something. God intended it for good. You didn't even know how you were being used, but you were. Because God can overcome anything if we give it. If we have to feed 5,000 in our own strength, we can't do it. We only have five loaves and two fish. But if we give it to the Lord, watch what happens. More will be left over than began with. You might say, Lord, I come today with really nothing. As long as you point your heart and your being here, listening for the word, God can take whatever you give him and do something amazing with it. Amen? Don't let the devil say you're not enough. Because the answer is you're not Give yourself to the Lord. Everything in our worship today, all the songs, are about not being worthy except one thing. Jesus says you're worthy. Who's going to be right? Who gets to be right? Amen? If you think about it, following Jesus is really answering this question. Who gets to be right in my life? God or me? That's not bad. Who gets to say what reality is? God or me? We're going to see a moment where... Jacob, this deceiver, this man who hasn't really done anything right except trust the Lord in, in the sense that God's with me, but in every other way, he's been manipulative and deceitful. He's the wrestler. He ends up alone. All his kids are in Egypt. He doesn't know if they're coming back. He thinks Joseph is dead, and he hears someone come to him and say, Joseph is alive. He sent this stuff. Come to Egypt. And Jacob has to decide what reality is, who's right, his own feeling or what he's being told and it's the same way with us. We're offered this gospel, we're offered this table, and whose reality gets to win? And Joseph said to his brothers, you guys don't understand. God is at work here, and so you're safe. All right, here's the story. <clears throat> the people of Israel, that is the sons of jo Jacob, live up in this area around Dothan, Shechem, and Hebron. They're migrant workers, they're farmers. They've amassed great wealth, but now there's a famine. They sold their brother Joseph into Egypt slavery. He's been elevated because God gave him a dream where he predicted seven years of plenty, told Pharaoh to store it, and there'll be seven years of famine. We're in year two of famine, and everything Joseph said has been born to be true. His starving family now comes to Egypt looking for food, and Joseph tests them, sends them on a journey so that they can discover that they need the Lord that they can be ready for what Joseph is about to tell him. And so the people make their way finally to this area of Goshen, and that's what we're going to cover today. Joseph, talking to his brothers, could not contain himself any longer. He hasn't revealed to them yet who he is. They're stumbling and bumbling, and he, and he says, <clears throat> have everybody leave my presence except his brothers. This is sort of the, the climax, almost the climax. So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. They have no idea that the, the assistant pharaoh they've been talking to, the number two man, is actually the brother they thought they killed. And he finally says, I'm Joseph. He was weeping. Why so loudly? <clears throat> He's, 
weeping because God is fulfilling this plan. Remember, it was spoken to Abraham. Abraham, leave Iraq, go to Israel, and I'll make, go to this area that one day will be called Israel. I'll make a nation of you, and from you I'll bless all nations. Well, it's a hundred and some years later, and it's coming to pass. Joseph weeps so loudly that Pharaoh's household hears about it. Joseph says to his brothers, I am Joseph. By the way, does Troy Bruza give you a Michael Keaton vibe, the actor? I, I never mentioned that to you, Troy. I know you're in here somewhere, but you do. And I just want you to say, I'm Batman. One time. <laughs> you're that cool. I'm Batman. Well, Joseph, I'm Joseph. I'm Joseph. Just like that. I'm Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were stupefied, terrified, shaking, quake. Are you, it, it was not even in their realm. Do you understand? Um, th- this is the power of salvation. For somebody who's lost to understand that Jesus, lo- I hope you had a moment where you realized this grace is amazing. Amen? And, and if you're like me, 35, 40, 50 years into faith, oh, Lord, help me never forget that it's this amazing. And, and, and all of a sudden, this man I'm talking to isn't just a man, it's Jesus. For the brothers, this guy we've been dealing with who sent us back and forth, put our money in our sacks, playing games with us, is actually our brother trying to redeem us? Is he gonna, and he's not going to kill us? What a moment. Joseph said to his brothers, come here. Come close to me. You know, and again, Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary. And, and, and some of us, we're afraid of him. There's parts of me where I think, wow, I won't get, I won't close up to Jesus sometimes. Because I sometimes think, well, I'll have to do something. Or I'll have, when he's just, he longs for our presence to bless us. It's like my grandson came in, I was at the Hillsdale Church yesterday room full of people. They were having a fair. And my, my little grandson, Wesley, saw me. And, and I just wanted him to run to me. I know. And he did. I'm not asking anything. He can't do a thing for me. Just hug me. And a little guy came and hugged me, and I picked him up and, you know, spun him around and probably made it so he'll never come to me again. But <laughs> God wants that. Come close. So Joseph says, come, come here. You know, this meal is a is a coming close to the Lord. It's just a receiving. You can't do anything. We'll ask you to respond to it, but it it is prior to anything you ever do. Joseph says, I'm your brother, the one you sold into Egypt. (laughs) You know, you had to add that qualifier. (laughs) And now don't be distressed. This is a tender, this is the tender heart of God. The day you realize your sin and you realize I'm a sinner and a rebel against God. The minute you realize that, that's one, a gift of the Holy Spirit. And two, that repentance needs to be, is is immediately wrapped up in, good, you got reality now. Here's another part of reality. Don't be distressed. Stop fearing. Don't be distressed. Don't be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now, there's been famine in the land. For the next five years, there'll be no plowing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you for two reasons. One, to preserve for you a remnant. And this Israel. Israel's always been a remnant. I don't know how people can look at the Holocaust and not say, this is the same nation that was preserved in the Babylonian captivity preserved in the Egyptian captivity, preserved in the German attack in our lifetimes, some of our lifetimes, not my lifetime, I don't know if any, but some lifetimes, in our last century, right? And a remnant. Why? Because this people's been set aside to point to Jesus so that Jesus might save your lives by a great deliverance. The people of Israel have been greatly delivered multiple times so that they could bring about a Savior who brings what? Blessings to all nations. Amen? It's just like the promise so many thousands of years ago. It's been lived out in our presence, and you're part of that story. 
Here's the great deliverance. It's a symbol and a sign. It's an invitation to participate in the greatest deliverance. Jesus descended through Judah and Jacob and Isaac and Abraham from that nation to bless all peoples and tongues and tribes and races. Anyone who believes. Praise God. So then he continues, it was not you that sent me here, but God. Hear this. Joseph is understanding evil brought into his life by someone else for evil purposes was actually intended by God for good purposes. That's how God deals with people who have free will, who can't be forced to love him, but need to learn to love him. We're put in a world where we can say, yes, God, or no, God. And there's consequences to each. And to the no God people, which turns out to be all of us, every one of us has the sin of Eve and Adam on us, God appeals to us and invites us, cannot force us, but is involved in such a way that we have to see that even the Holy Spirit has woken us. When God spoke to Lazarus, Lazarus, get up. He spoke to ears that were dead, and God had to open the ears so Lazarus could even hear God speak. If you've heard the Holy Spirit and you feel like any of this can be true, the Holy Spirit is talking to you and inviting you to participate in this great deliverance. That's how cosmic a moment it is when you become aware that, oh, it's Jesus. So Joseph says he made me father of Pharaoh, and he tells the story. He tells his brothers, go get dad and bring him back. I'll give you a place to live. Look, you can see for yourselves, it's really me. Tell my father about my honor here in Egypt. Go do it. Then he threw his arms around his brother Benjamin and wept. Benjamin embraced him weeping. He kissed all his brothers and he wept over them. It's just a beautiful scene. There is no bitterness in Joseph. Now, he remembers he's talking to like the key, his brothers are the Keystone Cops. You know, they're bumbling idiots. But God is saving them in spite of themselves. They're not worthy. They're being saved, and they have to what? Believe it and get with it. That's the, that's the situation you and I are in. The work is done. Will we step into its reality or not? That's the question. So the news reached Pharaoh that Joseph's brother has come. Pharaoh said to Joseph, tell your brothers, load your animals, return to the land. Pharaoh invites the Israelites to Egypt. This is the other big reason we're going so carefully through Genesis. Because I want you to understand, get into your mind, how the people of Israel go down as 75 people, about 70 people, into Egypt. They spend 400 years there. They were invited. They were starving. And they stayed. Things were good for a while. And then... They're, they got to be a big family, a pharaoh change. They trapped. That's how we escape slavery. God is at work in this plan. It's not over yet. I'm talking about Jesus, but I have the post-Easter uh, viewpoint. These people are way before that. But their families being... So, so they're getting a good moment. But this is how God leads a nation into Egypt and how two million of them 400 years later escape. This is the setup. And this is why. And this is why they were willing to live there. It was life. It was to preserve a remnant. So Pharaoh says, tell them to come, come on down. Never mind about your belongings, because the best of Egypt will be yours. So the sons of Israel did this. Joseph gave them carts. As Pharaoh commanded, he gave them provisions. To each of them, he gave new clothing. To Benjamin, his full brother, he gave five sets of clothing. And this is what he sent to his father. Donkeys, uh, the best things. Grain, bread, other provisions. And he sent his brothers away as they were leaving. And he said, listen, meatheads, don't argue on the way. So they went up out of Egypt and came to their father Jacob in the land of Canaan. They told him, Joseph is still alive. In fact, he's ruler of Egypt. Now, think about how they have to say this. They're put in the message position. Not only have to tell their dad, hey, Joseph is alive. Oh, and by the way, we tried to kill him. And we've been lying to you for 20 years. Hey, but if something's true... Just stick with the truth. Amen? I mean, when I witness to people, 
I share where I've seen God at work and where I've screwed it up. Amen? I share that I'm a sinner. And, and if somebody's in front, especially in counseling, if you've ever counseled with me, I'll get real specific. Why? Because I'm asking the same thing of you. And every one of us was rescued, and there's embarrassment in our testimony. Amen? Or we wouldn't need a Savior. But this is amazing news. So your dad, your Jacob, you have to receive it. Not only is your son not dead, he's alive and he rules Egypt. What? And you want me and my 100-year-old body to go back down there in a cart? Jacob was stunned and he didn't believe it. But when they told him everything Joseph had said to them, and when he saw the carts Joseph had sent to carry him back, the spirit of their father Jacob revived. When you share the gospel with something, have something to show them. You, you can't convince anybody, but you can give evidence. Amen? Somebody asked a drunk um, at, at a recovery program who had recovered, how, why do you believe all this Jesus stuff he, that, he, that he turned water into wine? And he said, well, I believe he turned water into wine because in my life he turned beer into furniture. He rescued my marriage. So he looks out and he sees this and he goes, oh, okay, I'm convinced my son Joseph is still alive. I'll go and see him before I die. So Israel, that is Jacob. And that, that, that's funny how the Bible switches to, to the name Israel. So he carries with him the, the, the nation's hopes. He set out with all that was his. He reached Beersheba. He offered sacrifices. God speaks to him there again and essentially says, go, I'll be with you. I will go to Egypt with you. Every time, the, the one thing God continually says is, Emmanuel, I am with you. I'm with you. Oh, and man, that's a blessed word, right? He is with you. He is with you. Are you perfect? No, he is with you. Do you trust in Jesus? He is with you. Jacob, just get in the cart and go. I'll be with you. Jesus says, in my father's house are many rooms. If it weren't so, I'd tell you. I go and prepare a place for you, and I will come back, and I'll take you. I'll put you on my cart, Jesus says. It's the same hope. Amen? Do you believe it? Do you believe that through no worth of your own, but by the great love of God, by trusting in Jesus, wherever you fall along the path, he has heaven for you, and he will come and load you up and take you. Do you believe it? Take a step with him, and you'll see. Jacob left Beersheba. He brings everything, all the stuff. Then the Bible tells us all the names of the 12 children and their children, so grandchildren and names. It totals up to 66 people, and when you add the two other wives, so all Jacob's women, it's 70, including Joseph's two sons. Jacob sent Judah ahead of him to get directions to Goshen. They don't go to where Joseph is. They go to where they're going to live, in the land of Goshen. When they arrived in the region of Goshen, Joseph had his chariot made ready and went to Goshen to meet his father Israel. As soon as Joseph appeared before him, he threw his arms around his father and wept for a long time. Can you imagine that reunion? Do you realize the buzz of heaven is just going to be these reunions and that feast we're going to have? I can't wait. Israel said to Joseph, now I'm ready to die since I've seen for myself that you're still alive. And Joseph said to his brothers and his father's household, I'll go speak to Pharaoh. So now the reason, I think the reason, Joseph's really thinking here, the reason he has his family go straight to Goshen is because, um, well, they might mess things up. <laughs> Don't, I'll deal with Pharaoh. You, you, you just go there. That's what he does. He says, listen, here's our, here's our story. I'll go speak to Pharaoh. Tell him your shepherds that you tend livestock. When Pharaoh calls you, what's your occupation? Say you tend livestock. Then you'll be allowed to settle in Goshen. For shepherds are detestable to the Egyptians. You'll actually provide a service to them. Joseph told Pharaoh, my father and brothers and their flocks and herds and everything are here. They're in Goshen. He chose five of his brothers, not all ten. And that's smart. And presented them to Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to Joseph, your father and your brothers have come to you, the land of Egypt is before you. Settle your father and your brothers in the best part of the land. Let them live in Goshen. And if you know any among them with special ability, put them in charge of my livestock. Because of Joseph, the sons of Jacob are honored. When I go to heaven and you get to heaven and we die, um, there's going to be judgment. And you and I who believe in Jesus will survive the judgment because of Jesus. 
everything due Jesus gets credited to us. Do you realize that? On the cross, he takes whose sin? Whose? Thank you for not saying yours, Kirk. Ours. <laughs> Mine and yours. And, and we take on what? His righteousness, his innocence, his, all that he receives. We are adopted into the family by our brother, Jesus. Sound familiar? I mean, this is, this, is to, this is to show the Jews and the world that this just wasn't made up like Mormonism. Sorry. There's no one little tablet somewhere. There's years and years of printed history and real life history. There's bones in the ground at the cave of Machpelah. There's probably iron in some part of the Red Sea somewhere, but it hasn't oxidized already. This is historical stuff, and it happened, and it didn't just happen by one person saying it happened. Generation after generation after generation in lands and seas. Our Bible has 66 books, many more than that authors. It's believable. There's enough evidence of the carts to take you home. Trust him. Pharaoh talked to Joseph. How old are you, man? I'm sorry, Jacob. I keep messing those up. You have to forgive me. I, in preparing the sermons, I look back, and I, it's not the first time I mess up Jacob and Joseph. He asked Jacob, how old are you? Jacob said, the years of my pilgrimage are 130. My years have been few and difficult. They, he's such a whiner. And they do not equal the years of the pilgrimage of my father's. Then Jacob blessed Pharaoh and went out from his presence. So Joseph settled his father and his brothers in Egypt. This is the main point before we finish. And gave them property in the best part of the land, the district of Ramesses, as Pharaoh directed. They end up as honored guests in Egypt. In a generation, they'll be slaves. The journey we're on. So here's our points today. It's chiefly a vehicle for the spiritual journey we must take. The lifetime journey you're on with its ups and its downs, with its rewards and broken hips, is not about where you end, how much money, how much fame, what you look like. It's only a vehicle, vehicle for you to grow spiritually. We are being tested, and the road leads sometimes, hopefully, if you're blessed, to a misery point where you turn yourself to your Savior. The journey of the people of Israel is bringing about Jesus. Their job is to be a remnant and to keep trusting, which they never do fully. But God is using them to develop a picture for these thousands of years, and I don't know how many more years to come, to show the beauty of Jesus. You're alive so that you could trust Jesus. That's what you got to get right. The one thing Jacob got right is, I need, I, God, you're there, and I want to pursue you. He was still devious at times, still deceptive. God saved him in spite of himself. But the one thing he got right that Esau didn't get right is, God, you're at work. Who is Jesus to you? And have you heard about him? And have you gotten on the cart for home? Is God at work around you? In you? In others? Do you recognize a God stronger than any Pharaoh that you face right now? Stronger than any part of nature? A God of rescued slaves and virgin births? Do you give the Lord the authority over even nature? The authority over the resurrection? Do, do, you, do you recognize that you've been drafted into a story by a God who created the earth from nothing? Do not underappreciate the power of our God and his love. Have you flipped the script then from that life that measures it by ups and downs to the life that sees a journey? And do you see that Jesus' great journey from Adam to today, his journey to you, to this table? For he is the one who on the night that he was betrayed 
revealed himself to his disciples. Amen? Do you realize how much like that meeting with the brothers, the meeting of Jesus was? He told them about his father's house. He washed their feet. And then he said, 